it's not easy to talk of the things past because I know all my past and present but I'm doing more for the future when Jesus comes we wouldn't have more Hitlers we wouldn't have more Catholics we wouldn't have more all those schisms <laughs> and before I start talking I like have a little talk boys and girls and you mommy put something on the table oh I don't like chocolate milk I don't like this don't leave any food to throw away because I have seen the curse came up on the German people 1945 June in Germany when the American GI finished his meal coffee and the meat and everything they put in the trash can flies flying around and German children like young children will come with their parts taken home and I said oh God this is already I will bless them will bless thee what a curse came up on the German people there's one curse came up on if Hitler would be alive the German people will never forget they shouldn't have started with the Jew you know any nation starting with the Jew pay the consequences and I left Germany bothered me the most a beautiful German girl blue eyes blonde carrying a child half black half white without a father and thousands was born of them in Germany in every statement Hitler made he said I want a pure I raised blonde blue eyes. He didn't want the Jews, he got something worse. <laughs> so anybody's going to pick on the Jews, you have to pay for it. <laughs> I'd like you to stand with me, I'd like to give you three verses. From Romans chapter 1, verse 14, 15, 16, I want you to stand with me, if I have your Bibles. <clears throat> I am adapted both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for, of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. To everyone who believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Our Father and our God, as I give Lord of the background, we thank thee that you are the one who loved me. You are the one who took me out from the grave and giving me an everlasting life. Thank you, Lord, for calling me when I was ready and not ashamed in preaching the gospel to the Jew and the non-Jew. Thank you, Lord, for blessing, and I pray the blessing will be on the people tonight in this church. Now, Pastor Rockman, and Associate Pastor Valley Jim, we thank the Lord for the servants of God who serve thee faithfully. We thank thee for the people who love thee, Lord, and not ashamed of thee. Bless us in the service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may sit down. A message, you have an introduction, you have points, you have an outline, a testimony, you don't know where to begin. So I begin with my childhood. I was born in the country Poland of an Orthodox Jewish family. We had five boys in our family, I didn't have any sisters. And when I got saved, I said, Lord, I didn't have a sister, give me a daughter. And he gave me first child, mine is a daughter, who I still love her, married, had lovely children. And as a Jewish family, we were raised respectfully. We honored our father and mother. As the Jewish faith teach, we should love. We always respect an older person. I grew up in Orthodox faith. My, in our home, was not allowed whiskey or cigarettes, cards. I never saw my father play. All things we just to play together chess. Even the wine for the Sabbath, my mother didn't buy Manischewitz. You know, you think four cups. And the pastor, you can get drunk. Manischewitz wine too. My mother made her own wine. And I believe you, Jesus used that wine. I will use the illustration. She took a jar and put raisins Tuesday. Friday afternoon, she squeezed them out and put in a little sugar. And that was the wine for our pastor. We're in our home. We're not allowed to bring in any strong things in our family. My father wasn't a saved man. Then I kept the commandments. And everything, and I grew up from kindergarten, schooling, in the Jewish school, Orthodox. In 1939, 
when the German army marched into Poland, I was taken from the rabbinical school. I was a, a orthodox rabbinical student. They call it a chachusit. Uh, my hair was not allowed to cut. I had to put them under my ears. And I said to the German who took me, I want to go home. I love my mom and my daddy. Can I say goodbye to them? You know, 45 years of age. And I was so close. My family said, you're never going to see him again. They're never going to see you again. And I couldn't say goodbye to my family. They told me I had to take a shower. A German word is Zobe. That means clean. The German people, very clean. You know, their culture, if you go even today in Germany, from a shoemaker to anybody, Mittagstunden, that's lunch. From 12 to 2 o'clock, you can get a shoemaker, put a hill for a, a thousand dollars. Because everything is closed from 12 to 2 o'clock. Everybody gets dressed. And they are very, very, very intelligent people. I mean, very, very wonderful people. Wouldn't be Hitler in World War I. They, the Jews were treated better than any country in Europe. That's why they laughed so much German that they took the Yiddish language. It's a German dialect. You know, all this good life, childhood, came to an end. I was going to my 14 years of age. I was taking a shower, I came out, my wallet, everything I had in my pants, they didn't give me back the pants, the pictures of my family. I was getting pajamas with stripes and a number put down. My number was already 75,522 because they never called you by name. And this would help the Antichrist too, <laughs> compute the numbers. By number, we were like a dog, we had a number. And then the food in the morning was one slice of bread, not baked, corn or wheat, something uh, was a mixture, 100 grams. Coffee, they burned something without sugar. It. it was just like dirty water. A hand pump for 55,000 people in Buchenwald, one hour. Whoever got water lived water, you have to live without water. A hand pump for 55,000 men. Then there was one woman, Miss Elsa Koch, who every day will take out 10 to 20 men. I'm talking now after Camp Buchenwald where I begin. And those men, she herself took off the skin and decorated her room. And the first two years we didn't know what happened to those men. They never, they never came back. There was quite a few times, you know, we lived 1,500 people, what's called a bag, you know, put a little piece of wood together, a lot of opening, when the snow came, we got snow, the wind came, we got wind, no heating inside. A hundred people were sleeping in one bed. Like, uh, you couldn't sit down, you had to sleep with your shoes, with your clothes, because otherwise they were taken away, that's the only clothes you had. The pair of pajamas, everything you had, you had on you. And if they take you to another consultation, you didn't have a suitcase to take anything, that's all you had, you went with you. Work every day. Seven days a week. If you complain, I have a cold, I'm sick, I can't go to work every day. The assessment storm to assess came in. Ah, you're sick, huh? You get help. Chematorium. Chematoriums were burning for 24 hours. 2,000 people were burned day every day. Buchenwald. Or Schwentchen, 5,000. No hospitals, no holidays, seven days a week. And when you talk with prisoners, they didn't say, I'm going, oh, when I get out of this camp, I'm going to buy a car, I'm going to buy good clothes, everybody taking, I get out of this camp, the first thing I'm going to get, a loaf of bread. Everybody talk the same language, a loaf of bread. Think of that. We are living in the United States, we're complaining inflation, we're complaining gas is high, Everybody wanted just a loaf of bread, that's all. Everybody wanted. You know, people smuggled in diamonds, people smuggled in uh, pieces of gold. You could pick it out as many as you want. Nobody was eating them. <laughs> if people are trying in this world to build everything, material things, I will tell you, one day can come, everything is taken away from you. The only thing is built on spiritual things. I have God in my heart. I didn't know Jesus, but the Germans could not take away God from me. But you know, the days went by, 
And when you suffer, the days are a little longer, the nights were cold, 30 below zero. I even worked in a lake at the dig, January, a lake at the cut the ice in the morning, going 30 below zero. For the first two months, I was feeling it's cold, but then, uh, you know, my body got so used, I didn't feel it's even cold, I didn't feel anything, because I had to go in, because it was a man with a gun will make you do everything. Cut in the morning, 6 o'clock the ice, go into a shovel, and dig, you know, if, if you dig out, you ever dig the lake, <laughs> it's mud. You see, the water takes away till you don't bring out anything, and they give you so much to build every day. And some of them, they didn't complete their work, they left them overnight, and they came in the morning, they were frozen, 30 below zero, no heating. And the German was having a leather coat, fore coat, boots, he was well dressed, warm. There was no mercy. But there is a God in heaven, I believe it. He sees everything, he knows everything, he hears everything. The Germans had another law. If you lived in one camp a year, you should have been destroyed. And they send you another camp. That's why I was sent to Dachau. It's like you're coming in in a school of freshmen or in the army. I could, you know, beginning all the hard work fell on you, you're starting everything new. Because those people are already there, settled. And I was sending around about 24 different camps. And I'll tell you something, I wouldn't have been alive today if I wouldn't believe there's a God. There were so many of the Jewish people who were very orthodox, they believed in God. They turned one to the other, do you still believe there's a God? Why is He taking us? It's chosen people and allowing this thing to happen. Don't you think uh, we should think a little there is a God? You know what happened? If you lost faith, you didn't have anything. They died. As not food, not anything. My faith was that there is a God. And if God wants me to die, I will die. If God wants me to live, I will live. And my faith began increasing. I live every day with God. I didn't know Jesus. But I believe in God, and I want you to know that Jesus is the God. Amen. I know I'm alive today because I talk to him today. I talk to him all the time. There was a lady coming from Atlanta with me, and she must have been Catholic because the plane was still on the ground. She put her on her rosaries and started shaking. I say, hold on to Jesus, sister, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be afraid. <laughs> the plane was still on the ground, and she was so nervous. <laughs> the plane didn't take off. And so, when we have Jesus, we can go everywhere. You can get a cassette of my life story, but if you like to get something, get of my wife. You're enjoying more because my wife comes from the reformed Sadducees. And I believe her testimony is even stronger than mine. You know, as the years went by in Germany, was always, a, we didn't have newspapers, radio, television, we were cut off the world. You know, the German people, by uh, Buchenwald, Weimar is the city. If you know by kilometers, if you don't know by the kilometers, 100 miles is 160 kilometers. You can figure out. 12 kilometers, the people in Weimar didn't know what was going on in Buchenwald. And the Nazis kept such a secret. that I don't say all the German nation knew what was going on. They were full. When... The American planes and British, 1944, they came and bombed Weimar, and German people laughed sweet jello, like we call it marmalade, they call it jelly, and they didn't have frigidaires, freezers in that time like we have, they had the basement, the shelter. And when the science came, the planes, they went in the shelter. And then we began seeing how the German people paid their consequences, because when the plane came at night, they hit our building Eight floors, ten floors, and all the people in the shelter couldn't get out. And we dig it out, German children, elder women. It was really pitiful, you know, their civilians suffered too. And then the German people looked at us. We didn't have any flesh. We looked like skeletons, you see some pictures. Then in the street, they were crying, wiping. Buchenwald was only 12, and they didn't know what was going on. Then they saw, almost by the end, a little different than the Germans pictured. Then Dachau, you know, every camp. But the greatest suffering, I met Eichmann, 
Now that I met him, I saw him. And all the Nazis, everyone knew everything what was going on. I want to ask you a question. Germany was well cultural, you know, cameras, the number one, you know, the Japanese are copying what the Germans discovered. Banks. Here, one man of Satan can take a whole nation. Martin Luther brought the formation. Hitler brought on Germany destruction. He doesn't take much. It takes one man to destroy a nation. That's why we should pray in the United States that God will give us the right men in leadership, the right president, the right senator, right congress, the decision Washington is made. I wish they would ask Jesus first than those advisors they have behind them. Now, by 1944, we find out the slaughterhouse was still land camp Poland. I forgot to tell you, I was born in a Roman Catholic state, and I'm going to tell you a little experience I had as a young boy. Being born in a Roman Catholic church, you should thank the Lord that the United States didn't had only a Catholic peasant for a little while. A Jew in Poland, a president could only be a Roman Catholic, not even a Protestant. And a Jew is completely wiped out. A Jew in Poland could not go to university, could not work in the post office, could not be a policeman, could not work for the government because he was a Jew, was not a Roman Catholic. A Jew was not allowed to go to university, yet have a lot of money, because everything is Roman Catholic. And then... Being six years of age, starting public school, the first time, the first time, people were supposed to believe in Jesus, giving a testimony for Jesus, told me, you dirty Jew, you kill Christ. I didn't know anything about him. How could I kill him? I didn't know who Christ was. I never heard in our home. I never heard in Jewish school. I didn't even know who Christ was. How could I kill him? I came home and said, Mom, you know what they told me today in school? I killed Christ. Shh, don't mention that name. I said, they told me, I, who is he? <laughs> but one thing I remember, six years of age, my mother told me, the second she put her hands, she said, son, remember, we Jews didn't establish ourselves. God chose us is for one purpose. The Messiah is going to come from our nation. And if you're going to live, she didn't say I, but she said of me. If you're going to live and to see when Israel becomes a nation and we get Jerusalem back, then the Messiah will come will not be the tail of the nation but the head of the nations. And my mother told me that. Now my mother was burned in the crematorium and I'm alive to see and to live in this generation. Think of that. Amen. 1944, you know, this was uh, my number was getting up and, you know, I was the highest, the first numbers, but it was building up. Everybody who came in was at a number, and they were trying to get rid of us. In 1944, they found a new method. We're going to take out every day 15,000 Jews from every concentration camp, and we're going to take you to another place. You know, they never told us the truth. And we have to march to Weimar, six in a line, as old men, you know, when you don't have anything in your stomach, and your mind thinks by foot, you don't know what's left and right. And the German says, with his machine gun, links, rechts, links, rechts, you know, we were out of step. And anybody who didn't like it took a mat and just put that bag in it, throw them away. Then we know that we're going in the slaughterhouse. Then we came to Weimar, to Weimar middle of the night for steel cars, pushed that in 150 men. And when we got in, there was no place you could sit down or fall down. And two assists on the top, and they didn't tell us where we're going. And the train took off almost by morning. You know, the train moved the first day. You know, human beings, we need to get fresh air, we need cleanness. No, the train didn't stop the second day, the third day. Many people cried in different language. Please give me water, you know, and nobody could move, nobody had anything. No food, no water, no sanitation. 
Five days and five nights, more than half in every wagon, the dead were staying. They couldn't fall down. Then we know, everybody knew that this is a, they didn't want to leave us in Bohoval dead. Dachau dead, they took us out to the storing us somewhere. Middle of the night, the thing stopped. I was in wagon 15. Everyone who was alive must come out. And they had the German black police dogs, world thing dogs. And those who came out, there was machine gun. And it was very cold at night, ice. Because where I jumped in that time was cars by Czechoslovakia. Normal time will take you about 24 hours. You know, the American, British, and the French planes, they bombed. In our war, first you cut off the transportation because you don't deliver tanks, you don't deliver soldiers. So we went around five days and five nights to Karlsbad, Czechoslovakia, from East Germany. You know that God is everywhere. And everyone, I will tell you something. When you are unsaved, you're not ready to die. I was afraid to die. I was fighting for my life. I asked God, He gave me every help I wanted to live. I don't know why. Now I know why. Amen. But you know, if I wouldn't put in my mind, in my heart, God, you're going to help me, I'm going to live, I would have been in debt. Because if people give up, they die. That's all this. In everything, the same thing is with the gospel. If you're going to decide it, I'm going to win souls, you're going to win souls. You can tell your mind, and I can win souls, you're not going to win souls. The same thing in Lord's work. And that time, as the people came out, I don't know what happened. I always said, I pray, I said, Lord God, you know what I'm going at. If I go out, I, you know everything, and I give myself over to thee. You know, there is the, the wagon in the dam, there's a very small hole. And I don't know, some of the prisoners were rushing. Instead of pushing me out, I fell down, because it was night time. I didn't see anything. Now when I fell down, I say I'm not going to go up, whatever it is. So I laid my dance, myself down flat, you know, think just having pajamas. No heavy coat, nothing. Completely flat. You see what happened if the train moves because it was night and would be dead and couldn't do. The train moved away a couple of hundred feet. I still heard some of those they shot, oh, Oh, you know how it hurts, you know. People don't die right away sometimes. And they shoot them because it was night time. So I was thinking, I will get up. I wasn't wounded or anything. You know, the Lord gave me this strength. I didn't have food, anything for five and a half days. And I begin in a different language. Can I help anybody? Anybody alive? And I heard. And I was going to help those people. I, the train stopped. And then it was night time because the first. I heard with heavy boots, those Nazis were wearing boots. I had somebody coming, and I was afraid they're going to see me because it was night time. I dig myself in under those dead bodies with my pajamas. You know, I was full of blood, frozen. And then I heard they came closer. One Nazi said to the other, Let's make sure those dogs are dead. And they took out their bag nets, put in, in the machine guns. He was staying two before me, went all through, and then the other said, Hans. I can stand smells and cold. Let's go. He said, no, no. Let's inspect a few more. And as they were talking, they crossed me over to the third one, went through, and then the other said, yeah, let's go back. Yeah, smells. Know. Those dogs are dead. But you know, thank the Lord, I got up. I wasn't dead. Amen. And when I got up, I said, anybody, I can help now. I didn't hear any voice. <laughs> now, I jumped. I didn't have identification. I didn't have money. The Germans, when they came into every country, they're rationing. Even Germany was rationing so much for our family. In every city, the families were registered. So much sugar for our families, so much. And if you didn't have those ration cards, you couldn't buy anything. Now I said, I jumped. What am I going to do now? If I go out, any policeman catch me, I don't have identification. I tell them I'm a Jew, I'll be killed right away. I said, God, I'm completely over in your hands. If you want me to die, I will die. If you want me to live, because I don't have, I can't do anything. Amen. I found a hole in the woods. You ever live in the woods at night time? 
30 below zero, was dick for somebody, and it was a little shorter than I, and I was with my bones trying to sleep, you know, stones, the snow, the coldness were coming for hurting me at this side, and I couldn't put my legs completely, and then I was trying to sleep, the wind was blowing the trees, and I jumped up, and somebody's coming, you know, being by yourself. And it was terrible, and I said many times to God, I said, God, why don't let me die in this hole? No food, nothing, nobody. I'm going to survive. I never had experienced this, you know, but God let me go through different ways. So one night I decided, I looked out from the woods and I saw one house had a light, two o'clock in the night. And the first time in my life, I decided I'm going begging because I didn't have money. And I was thinking, there's some German people, nighttime I will come in, maybe they'll give me a blanket, they will give me something, you know. I didn't have... So I came in the first house and I learned something experience. The lady said to me, if you go away, mister, you know, the German language, because my husband just came home from work, you wake him up, he wouldn't like it, you better go away. And I said, everybody's asleep, only your house is light. Could you do something for me? You know, like a lady, she said, Hans, picked up their husband, they have company. And he came dressed up with this storm to head police, with, with a paper or spice that is an invocation. I said, I don't have any. Well, you were told him plainly, if I'm going to die, I won't die a Jew. I don't want to lie. I said, I'm Jewish. I escaped from that thing. And I told him everything. You know, under the German law, you don't have time for courts. You take the shovel, and right in the front of my house, you're going to dig your grave, you're going to be killed by daytime. This was 2 o'clock. Now, you know, those Nazis you have obey, but you have to dig your own grave. And he started screaming, make fest, you know, before daytime. I said, I'm doing my best. You want to kill me, you can kill me this way, but I have to dig the grave. I, and it was frozen, 30 below zero, like digging in, in glass or, or steel. You know, it's frozen. I had to have me the hammer in digging. And then, you know, by 6 o'clock, his wife came out, started crying. I wish I wouldn't have told you. This man didn't do anything. We could have given something. He said, no, we can't let those people use because just, he told his wife, just yesterday, the underground, dynamite, a German train ammunition, and they blow up. We're looking for those people. Maybe he's one of them. I didn't have a gun. I didn't have anything. How could I? I, I didn't do anything, but, you know, he said, I dig my grave, and I know I wouldn't get that alive. I'm glad that not one of you had that experience. Digging your own grave, you know you're going to die. And there's no way out. Thinking of yourself, but your family. You went three times to the synagogue praying every day, loving God. Why, 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 why? You don't get the answer till God answers. So the last minute, put me up on the soil, told his wife, move back to Germany. People, very perfection. Six feet back, that it will, the first bullet will hit me in my forehead and I will fall back and it will leave me open for the dogs. That's what I heard it's going to do. And you know, if somebody comes before you with a gun, measures, and figures out, and when he let that figure go, you would get nervous too. You know, my feet start shaking and I, shaked, I got down and he missed me. He came over, hit me this side, this side. I told him to stay still. I said, I couldn't help it. <laughs> He missed me. He missed the bullet. He said, we don't want to waste another bullet. And a little time more to live. You know, you know, I would tell you something. Every second was God's will. Amen. Then I look on the trees. You ever been winter time up? The trees, the icicles, the sun started coming up. What a beautiful world to live. I never had a gun in my hand. I never did anything wrong. Why, why, why? And I said, God, I'm all yours. If you want me to escape, I go and escape. But if you want me alive, I will do anything you want me. And this didn't come from the mind. It came from my heart. I always prayed for my prayer book. But this time I didn't even have a prayer book. It came from my heart. I said, God, I'm all yours. You know, I didn't have a long distance operator. Give me God, I need him right now. <laughs> 
I didn't have anybody to assist me. I will tell you, this was minutes. And you know something? That God hears in my sinner's prayer. Amen. And I heard a man, he was tall, he had a blue uniform. This assessment is a black uniform. He had SS Sturmtruppe. That meant the blue uniform. And he was a happy man like you people are. Hans, we gaze what's lost, you know. It, it was here in the morning. He said, I am so busy, I have a spy here. That's what he, he didn't tell him. I'm Jewish, I'm a spy. And I want to kill him before you come. He said, wait, I have good news to tell you. And I didn't hear news since 1939. Then in my newspaper, radio, we, we were cut off the world. We didn't know what was going on. And I heard from my German lips. The Americans are beating us in the west, the Russians in the east, and Germany kaput. And I was glad to hear this. If I'm going to die, that Germany is losing the war. He <laughs> <laughs> said, Hans, give me the pistol. He said, what? He said, why should we kill him right here in our little city? If the Americans come in, I will take him down the woods. In a little argument, he was stronger, and then he got the gun and said to him, I don't know why, I'm, so, I'm supposed to work to the 6 o'clock shift, and they are announcing the radio there's going to be a blitz storm, you know, snow and ice and windy, and the men cannot leave me a half an hour yearly. I know why. <laughs> he said, I would have come 6 o'clock, that man would have been dead. You know, and then he holds back. He got that gun. And that German SS wanted to go with him and say, you stay here. He said, remember, I will check your gun and I will check the grave. He took me down deep in the woods and he digged at two feet to the grave mark and he said, run! He said, I will shoot in the air. And I didn't trust him because he was a German. I said, the other one, the other, the other one wants to give me a bullet in the head. Now he's going to give me a bullet in the back. <laughs> I'd obey, I ran. And you know, he didn't kill me. Amen. You know the first thing I did? If somebody does something for you, save your life, don't you say thank you? Amen. And I said, God, thank you. Amen. And I know nobody else was not Moses, was not Abraham, it was not anybody of my family, it was Jesus in that time, even I didn't Amen. believe. Who came and saved me from that cave. Now, nah, I don't know all this. Nine different, ten times, in different ways, and every time I was delivered. Don't you think there is a God? How can the atheist, the agnostic say, I, there is no God? I would tell you, I have a lot of things to prove there is a living God. Amen. Now you know the war was not over. I had to hide myself till May the 5th, night and 45th, for three months, you know, with that, living by yourself in the woods. The farmers put in potatoes, you know, they cut them six to seven pieces. I went the night digging them out, find a little can <laughs> with that salt, boil them with snow, and that was my meal, and it was better than Buchenwald. And I will never forget, and I'm going to tell you and laugh. You know, when uh, those for you on the army, on the front line, nighttime, our telly lights up more than daytime, you can see. You see, I was in the Czechoslovakian side, and the Germans were there. And the Americans were coming from Germany. And nighttime you could see those heavy artillery coming over. Then the Germans answered, a little light there. And so I decided I'm going to walk at night. And wherever fights there, I will cross over. And sometimes I would go in the lakes and the snow. You know, I didn't see in waters. But I would climb. In daytime I would hide myself. I will never forget. I stood in the Carpathian Mountains in Czechoslovakia. And I heard motorization. I was on top of the hill. And I saw the first tank, green helms, and the tank had like a, was a green tank and had a five-point star because I was on the top of the hill, looked like the Star of David. That was American <laughs> Patrol. And then I looked at a heavy truck, jeep, I never saw Americans before. And I think, boy, if this is the Israel army, I'm going to be greeted. <laughs> There was the German business, you know, the Germans gave himself over to the American army. All the generals gave an ultimatum, the Russians going to take, because the Russians took vengeance. 
They raped women, they killed, they did the same thing what the Nazis did. The Americans, you know, they gave them right away cigarettes, cheese, different things. They opened up the stores, made normal. So they gave themselves over to the Americans. The Germans took off their guns. The American GIs didn't know. Some put down six, seven, those uh, pistols. They took the cameras away from them there. The German prisoners, they were telling them, see how good we are. They brought French prisoners, uh, it, all the um, English prisoners, the Americans, see, we didn't kill them. See how good we are? Cigarette. And the American gave them a cigarette. But the greatest thing bothered me, I couldn't understand. I spoke Yiddish, I spoke German. Those soldiers didn't understand. They pushed me aside. They didn't know where I was. But when the company came in by 10 o'clock, you know, their faces were still dirty, GIs. And the German girls got in the tongue, started thinking wine together, making laugh, they understood, and they didn't know English either. It bothered me for a while. Here, yesterday, they were the enemies, and now the girls got smart. They got in the tongues, they got cigarettes, chocolate, they give them everything. They don't even recognize me. I could have been dead yesterday. It bothered me for a little while. But I say, thank God for the Americans. They came to feed me. Now I'm free. I didn't have the freedom for too long. They opened up the homes, they opened up the restaurants, you know, became normal, the Americans right away, they didn't take anything. The third day, I got up in the morning, instead of finding the Americans, I find the Russians. The Americans didn't tell us that they're leaving in the middle of the night. And the Czech people said, President Benish was here in the United States and he promised us that the Americans are going to feed us, they're going to help us. Nah, we don't trust more the Americans. They begin hating the American people. They say they came to feed us, they came to take our country, giving over to the Russians. We don't believe in more in the major Slovakia communistic country. And you know, I want to tell you something. If you suffered under the Nazis, you couldn't trust the Russians either. A Czech man came and told me that the Germans left that same with 200 Jewish girls to die. They needed medical help. And I learned a little of the Russian language. And I went to a staff lieutenant, like a captain in the American army, and I said, I need Red Cross help for the Jewish girls. And he got up and said, can I use them for my soldiers? I help him. If not, let them die. Oh. I said, the Germans did the same thing. Then they did things I don't want to mention even the church to women the obes every soldier with a bike and they they didn't they did would not have the uniform like they have today you know they won World War II Russia the soldiers were having a piece of stink this machine gun you should see the shoes you should see the clothes bikes and they grabbed everything they didn't know what a hand watch was they were trying to put on their ears so ignorant A piece of pump and a bottle of vodka, that's all you know. Get drunk. And I didn't like to be under the Russians. And I had a hard time to get over to the American side. And when I came over to the American side, the first thing I went to see, I see, and they were all Jewish fellows. <laughs> they were the interpreters or dolmetchers, you know, speaking German, because Jewish is very similar to German. And say, what do you like to do? I said, I don't want to go back to Poland. I want to go to a country where I'm going to find freedom. He said, why don't you put on the uniform, work with displaced persons, be with us, you can help us speaking the different languages. You know, to find out my trouble was, the war was over, I couldn't eat even bread. My stomach was shrunk. Every hard food I ate got stuck right here, couldn't go through six years and I say to the soldiers I will give you everything what I got could you give me the orange juice and just milk I, ca I thinking I couldn't eat anything now the war was over and you know many of those prisoners like myself who came out got into a bakery tied up bread tied meat hot food you know you kill it your body was destroyed was so damaged that you didn't have any vitamins you didn't have any of those things that you throw was so shrink and your stomach was, I think, you couldn't, you had to little by little build up. And I began doing our work, I enjoy it. This place, persons came, and they said, we're going back to Holland. I said, I'm going with you. You see, it's a nice country, maybe I settle down there. 
When I went with them, didn't cost me transportation. I went there, beautiful country. People were nice. They saw it under Hitler. But then the Lord led me back. I went to Norway. Stayed a little and back. Then I said, see, I see. It's Bamberg. This city was not bombed. It was only 30 kilometers from Nuremberg. But Nuremberg was completely destroyed. You know, Nuremberg, where the Germans made all those propaganda came out of Nuremberg. And I said, would you let me go and I'm going to travel big cities and get more Jews coming here? Because I found out the Nazis who took away the Jewish homes, why don't the Jewish people have to live in prison camps like the displaced persons? There's houses we've taken back from the Nazis. So I went to Stuttgart and I found Jews and one of them is my wife. And I could, there was a curfew in the night after 6 o'clock the AMP would arrest you. But I had the uniform, I was staying with the AMP and all we... And I saw a group of people just came back from Poland. Listen to this. After the war, my wife was one of them. The MP said, I'm going to arrest them. I said, wait, let me go find out. You don't know their language. And they told me they're all Jews. They went to Poland. They sold their homes. My wife's father was a doctor. The maid was, who raised my wife, you know, they had a maid, a Polish maid, told her, if you come in the house, I kill you. You have nothing here. Leave Poland right away. And there were seven Jews of my city went home. They sold the homes in daytime. That was after the war. The Russians were there. The Catholics were there. They came in the night. The Polish people cut off their heads, took the money back. And told me never go back to Poland. And I never wanted to go back to Poland. And my wife came told me that story. And she said, Ben, we're going to Palestine. I said, how are we going to go? The British don't let us in. And I don't want to get wind up in another concentration camp. I said, you stay here. I will go. And I worked with the Irgun and the Haganah. They have my name and they got everything. And you know, and I went through the British blockade. But when I came to Palestine, I said, this is not the place. I have to fight the Arabs. There was less than 400,000 Jews. Israel was not a nation. And uh, English control, you know, they almost did like the Germans. They didn't like you. They arrested you. And that's why England became, stayed Great Britain, became Small Britain. And the Benjamin Disraeli, she controlled one end to the other. Now England became very small. Every nation who is not going to love the Jewish people will be cursed. You know why the United States is the most blessed country in the world? We have more Jews than Israel, five and a half million. And as a nation, we're still friendly to the Jews. We didn't tell them, leave us. If the Jews leave us, we would really have inflation more than this now. They keep the economy going. You try a country without the Jews, you're going to find out. And you know that the Lord, and I came back, I said to my wife, we're not going to Israel, to Palestine. She said, I'm going. I said, no, we're not going. I said, where are we going? We, don't, we didn't know that we had family here. I said, there's a Jewish organization going to wait on the list. Uh, we want to go to the United States. No, just try you know, I said, people go only there making money because she didn't have much faith. I said, I will go there for another purpose. Maybe God has something for me there. I didn't come to this country to make money. I came here where God really wanted me. I completed my studying. You know, as a young boy, I didn't have any training. So I completed the Jewish school. I became a teacher of the law, bar mitzvah, teach the Jewish boys learning. I made good money. More I made, my wife wanted to spend. She said, Ben, we didn't have any teenagers years, and let's make it up. And she wanted to go every night dancing, and I learned the Bible. I didn't know how to dance. I said, I'm not going to step people's foot. I don't know how. She said, I'm going to dance with other men. I said, I don't like that either. <laughs> I begin looking. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek me, you shall find me. You know, if you don't look for the Lord, you're not going to find him. You have to look for him. And the Lord worked that way. I had a bar mitzvah. I'm going to explain what a bar mitzvah. You see, a Jewish child, when he is, when he is a boy, is more watched by the parents. A girl also. To 13 years, the parents are responsible every sin the child committed. That's why you become 13 years of age. You can go to a prayer meeting. You see, the Jewish Orthodox, when they have a prayer meeting in a synagogue, there have to be 10 men. There can be a thousand women. No, there have to be 10 men. You have to be 13 years of age. 
And the Jewish boy, when he becomes Bar Mitzvah, the father makes a big celebration. Some spent thousands, thousands of dollars to show for the people and also for the boy. And then he read the Torah and the boy set the reference, you know, the law is that in the synagogue only Saturday. And the references of the prophecies is one thing when they come to Isaiah 53, they skip over to Isaiah 54. And this bothered me for a while because, you know, I didn't know that was reference to Jesus. But I said, if Isaiah put it in, we should read book after book. And I never got the answer. And after I performed this big celebration, I got a nice tip. That Jewish boy, 13 years of age, put to me a question I didn't have an answer. And that's a shame. You know, when you're a teacher, and your student comes to you for a question, and you look in the commentaries, you can't find the answer. He said, Rabbi, that's what they call another word, teacher means, Rabbi, today I became 13 years of age. My father is very happy, but I am unhappy. If I die today, what would happen to my soul? I said, son, I don't know. The only thing I was trying to explain the law. You see, the Jewish law is this. If you are good, you keep the Ten Commandments, you don't kill, you obey God, you go in the grave, you have to have a son pray for you three times a day for the whole year that your soul will come out like purgatory the Catholics made a business out. But the Jewish people say, you pray out the soul. You know, Tetzel made a great mistake. He said, you have to bell at the ring, you put in so much for, your, for the soul. But the Jewish people said, no money, pray for it. And I said, if you get messy, but I'm 13 years of age. If I don't have children, what's going to happen to me? I said, son, I'm going to find the answer. And I looked at Talmud, I look all the references, but you know, everything man has written, there's no answer. Right. I think I should have gone to the Bible the first time. Amen. Guess what I read the first time? I didn't tell anybody. Amen. Isaiah 53. Amen. The forbidden book. The Jewish people call it, that's the Gentile gospel in Isaiah. And I call it, John's Gospels, like John 3.16. And the Hebrew bothered me because Israel is always represented in the Bible as she. One Jewish man asked me, how did God have a son? Jehovah the Father, Israel the wife, Jesus the Son. And the pronouns, he was wounded for my transgression, he was bruised for my iniquities. And you know, and I couldn't keep myself, I went to the head there, but I said, hey, but Levi, uh, Isaiah 53 it's not Israel I said you do something wrong to Israel the whole world knows he humbled it didn't open his mouth who is that? he said son I will tell the truth the Gentiles have made him the Messiah we Jews don't accept it that's why we don't read that chapter you know you tell such child don't do it he likes to do it yeah. I wanted to find out more and you know the Holy Spirit revealed I was reading 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 and you know, it was done other than Jesus. I don't have a temple, I don't have a sacrifice, I don't have a holy priest. Where can I bring my sins? It has to be by blood. Leviticus 17.11, the light of flesh is blood, and I don't have a blood sacrifice. How can God forgive my sins? You know, I wasn't saved yet. I told the boy... This is the Messiah. If you're going to believe in Him, if you die, He's the only way to heaven. I didn't read yet the New Testament. That boy did a good thing for me. He went and told his mother. His mother told the rabbi, you know, I came next Saturday to the service. I was fired. <laughs> Not only fired. My brother was there. My cousins was there. All the, all the other families. And I had a funeral. I was on one side. There was a candlelight. My brother said that that prayer for me, another came up and they spit on me and they said, I didn't, I didn't know where to turn. Go home, tell my wife, <laughs> you know, she, she wouldn't agree. You know, I begin having now persecution among the Jewish people. And Jesus said, blessed are ye, even men shall revile who persecute you. I begin to look at Jesus, I said, Lord, are you choose me for persecution more? Didn't I have enough? I, I came here to this country to find freedom, happiness. Now, how long is this going to last? They can send me back to you because I came to the Jewish organization. And you know, I found another synagogue. It didn't last long. And they got my name wrong. There was an act in Hollywood, Ben Blue. And they said, you name Ben Blue? No, I said, it's Ben David Blue, L-E-W. I said, oh, that's it. Uh, fire it. 
in my and you know Jesus came into my heart now when Jesus comes into your heart I don't know if you can stay still every job I was looking everywhere when I told I found Jesus in this country I didn't come to get rich I found peace and joy and I began smiling for the first time till that time I couldn't smile but I told my wife I said Esther I found something in the United States I collected and didn't send it. He said, what do you find? You can pay all the bills? I said, I found Jesus the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. He said, what? <laughs> you lost your mind? You mean you have to come all the way to the United States, lost your mind? I said, you're going to lose your mind too. Because that's the only truth that came. And I told the people, I said, don't push my wife. I know her better. Pray for her. The time will come. We didn't expect to have children. Guess what happened? My wife got pregnant. A girl was born. I said, yes, that's Jesus because I didn't have any sisters. And I asked him to give me a daughter, the first girl. And I said, don't send me any people because I'm not going to talk to them. I, you want to believe, go believe, but I am not going to follow you because we as Jews, I'm going to stay in a Jew and die a Jew. I didn't want to go into the ministry, you know, because I had a hard time. I spoke only Yiddish, Hebrew, among the Jewish people in New York, and there's a lot of Jews in New York. I really witnessed, I did my job in New York, and the Lord calls it to New York, it's a good mission for the God. There's everything there. And I will never forget, I was attending a Baptist church, I know why the Lord led me, the first church was Baptist. I didn't know the difference from Lutheran to Catholics, the only thing I looked for a church didn't have a cross or didn't have a picture inside of Jesus. Because thou shalt not have gave me images before thee. And my wife came home, they prayed in the church that she would get saved. She came home pushing the baby and said, Ben, you wouldn't guess. Anybody be, ever been in Brooklyn? You know Brooklyn? Broadway, near Marcy Avenue, three things, one on the top, the Navy shipyard, five o'clock, blow the whistles. My wife never played in her life. He said she was pushing the baby, I close. And he said, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Amen. And she came home, she found Jesus. And this was more than anything in the world was worth coming to the United States, finding the truth. Amen. And now, when my wife got saved, the Jewish people couldn't point their finger to me. You see, he believes in Jesus because he married a Gentile girl. She was Jewish too. It was a brigade of testimony. And she couldn't put her finger on anything. And she started witnessing. And then she said, Ben, I'm going to pray that you will go in the Lord's work among our old people and I'm going to be behind you. I will tell you. Only a living God can answer a prayer like this. Somebody was against Jesus. <laughs> Somebody warned you not to believe. Then she's going to pray that you're going into the ministry and she's going to help you. So I went to Bible college. My wife lived in Brooklyn and $10 a week with a child. That's all I could make. And I stayed in school and I will tell you, I went in that Bible, I didn't go to find a girl to get married. I went in to, and loved me the Lord. And I was sitting with that Bible and studying and I wanted to get good grades and I wanted because my English was poorer than today. And you know, it's hard, uh, when you're born in the United States, uh, to go to school, you understand the questions. But when you're born in another country, and you don't use the language, you get a little older, it's a little harder memorizing things. Amen. It wasn't easy, but middle Lord, everything is possible. Amen. I had final exams, systematic theology, Pauline epistles. I took my schedule because I was anxious to go into ministry. And guess what? A child was born, the second child, two pounds. He had to put in the incubator. And I had six exams that day. And they didn't want to tell until the exams was over. They said, they need your signature. My wife gave birth to a child, two pounds. And if you don't sign soon, he lost a few answers already. They put him in a cigar box. So I went down. And they said, it's $35 a day for incubator. There's only one hospital. It was a strike in Brooklyn, New York. It was one Catholic hospital. And they, I had them uh, two hours, they wouldn't take in this child. They want me to sign an application that I'm going to be a Catholic missionary. 
They, they, one man said to the other, there's, there's a Jew who he's so mixed up, he don't know what he's saying. He's going to be a missionary to the Jews. And he said that Paul was, was Jewish and Peter was Jewish. You know, he's all wrong. We can't put it on. Then a priest came and said, forgive those men. They don't understand. They just say, why didn't you come to us instead of coming to the Baptists? And I said, I didn't come by myself. The Lord asked me. <laughs> and I said, if you want, I can write up a little why, what happened. My Lord, up a little sack. And you know, when I came the next day, the same nuns, uh, Mr. Lou, your son is not going to be too long here. You're supposed to feed him every two hours. He wants to be fed every half an hour. And he wakes up the other children to put him in a separate room. I said, thank the Lord for that. It's going to save a lot of money because I didn't have any. And you know, when I took the child out, to this day they never sent me a dollar bill because I gave a testimony what Jesus did for me. And then the doctors told us we should not move the child. And I went to California. And I stopped to Michigan. I didn't have any family. I didn't have any pastor. I didn't have anybody. You know, the Lord wants you to be in His ministry. He has a place for everybody. And a lady was driving me. It was Saturday. We came into Detroit. 12 o'clock. You know, they're sitting in the Greyhound stations. The next bus was leaving for Chicago at 3 o'clock and a Christian lady said to me, Brother, I know you read the Bible and you leave our family with two children with art money looking for a place to go for the Lord's ministry and I know you're a Christian. Would you like to come and go with us to church and you stay over in our home wouldn't cost you anything. You know, I'm Jewish. And I didn't have any one didn't cost you anything. I went. And I gave a testimony to the church and they say there's a city where I live in North Park 45,000 Jews, nobody's witnessing to them. Southfield has about 30,000. There's another city, together about 180,000 Jews, no witness, nobody did anything for them. I said, I'm going to see if the, it was Lord's will. You know, I didn't want to make my own decision. I gave my testimony in the church, and a man at a radio station, Mr. Sparks, who died, he never gave anybody anything. In the middle of the week, Jew, he advertised Jewish furniture, different things. And he asked me why I would come him time, give a five minutes testimony. He said, they got more letters, more calls than anything. Hey, hey, people will help me if I will establish a work in Michigan. I said, I want only Baptist people. I don't know why. And you know, the first broadcast was a Jewish family. The men lost us all this morning. I fight his wife and my accent. And I went to their home. I brought them together. Accepted the Lord. That's not bad after one Jewish, after one radio program free. It was 11.15 the night to 11.30. The second program was a Catholic man, 90 years of age, Smith, blinded. And he was given a lot of money to the Catholic Church and the priest came collecting and he wasn't sure if he dies going directly to heaven. You know, a man is blind, living in a chair for 15 years, his son taking care and I led him to the Lord and I told him, he need more the priest because he can go directly to heaven. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And by Jesus, if you die in the Smith, you're going to heaven. And I led a Catholic man to the Lord. And when I leave that Catholic home, he said to me, the priest comes every Tuesday, give me communion. I said, I'd like to be there too. <laughs> so I was in the kitchen. He came there, stopped. You know, the Jew everything you know the priest has is the Jewish clothes. They copy it from the Jewish people. He had that yarmulke, a little shawl, numbers 1538, and a red napkin, and he gave Mr. Smith communion. Mr. Smith said, Father, I don't need more communion because I talk to Jesus all the time. And you don't come here. And he got so hard, he said, who came in your house? And you know what I did? I destroyed all the pictures, the statues, with a lot of them. I put them in the garbage, never put them together. He said, whoever did, I will sue him, take him to court, and get the sharpest Catholic lawyers. And we get that man, teach him a lesson. He will never do that, coming in our home, destroying religion. So I came in. I said, Father, I'm Jewish. I believe in Jesus. And if you're going to take a lawyer, I have the sharpest Jewish lawyer. Never lost a case. <laughs> and Mr. Smith was afraid. He said, if you need money to pay the lawyer, I give you all the money. I said, no, Mr. Smith. The lawyer is Jesus. And he, he never, and he's the best Jewish lawyer. He never lost a case. 
Three months went by, nothing happened. So the man said, you son, you're telling the truth, I needed a car. So the man bought me a new car. I want you to say that the Lord, if you have faith, and you have faith, young people, if you're leaving Bible school, you're going to Lord's ministry, if you want it right away, everything is not of the Lord. You know that? It has to be the Lord by faith. I got a car. I got a radio broadcast free. My wife was still in New York. And I said, Esther, I'm coming to take you to Michigan. We're moving to Michigan. He said, how do you know? I said, I told her what happened. He said, it looks like because you could have gone. We know a lot of Jewish missionaries where they're going church to church raising money. They never go witness the Jewish people. Now, I am not afraid of the Jewish people. I'm Jewish myself. Why shouldn't I witness them? Why should they go to hell? Why should they be killed? They need the gospel. That's the only solution for Israel and for the Jewish people is Jesus, nothing else. Amen. So we settled in Michigan. And the Lord has blessed us. Everybody can get over when they come to our meeting. You're going to see tomorrow night, two months ago, a Jewish doctor, 28 years of age. You know, he was, I would not going to give his testimony, I want you to hear. He was, I have a television program five and a half years now. Now, you know, in our Jewish mission, is different than a church. I don't take any offerings in our meetings. You say, why? Because most is unsafe Jewish people. And if I say I'm going to take a nothing, unsafe people, they think, oh, you see why he wants us to come? He wants our money. So I'm doing what Paul did. He went to Corinth, Ephesus, took a nothing, brought to Jerusalem. <laughs> One Jewish man just asked me last week, he said, how come your television program? You said I counted but 25 times Jesus. And I watched Christian ministers. They talk more about money than about Jesus. How come? Yeah. I said, I want to tell you the truth. Every time I say Jesus, it pays the bill. <laughs> For five and a half years, I advertise him. He pays all the bills. Nobody else puts in the television program. You see, now our mission, we have a law. The television program don't support itself the first year. I wouldn't stay in television. But it now brings in a bath. I was on till uh, this year, January, seven television stations. The reason I was taken off from the stations, when they showed the film, Holocaust, how many seen Holocaust on television? Pat Robinson, 700 Club, and Jimmy Baker called me and said, we find you, are, you and your wife are the only Jewish people because the... The only Jewish people that you bought Jewish, and if you appear in our program, we would offer you a lot of money, we put you on in the, all the world. And I said, thank you, Peter. I said, I'm Baptist, I'm a different Baptist than I am, and I don't want to appear for any money, for anything. I don't want to appear in your program. And then I told Jimmy Baker too, I said, if the Lord wants me to build up my ministry, I let Jesus do it. I don't need anybody else. And, and you know, they canceled. They canceled Florida, I was on Miami, Channel 40, once a good station, I was on 40, in Atlanta, Georgia, Chattanooga, Tennessee. No, I thank the Lord, we're winning more Jewish people now than ever before with this station. We're reaching Ohio, we're reaching Canada, as far as London, Ontario. Every Sunday night, 10 o'clock, Jerry Fowler comes on from 9 to 10, I come from 10, 10, 30, Jack Van Impe, 10, 30, 11. It's not bad to be among those two Baptists, you know. Couldn't. <laughs> I wish that the... Uh, Rockman would be on before me, it was better than Jerry Fulver. <laughs> so, but still, and there's not a week Jewish people don't come to the Lord. I had last Sunday night on Dr. Schindler. Think of that, a week. I made the film very fast. This film was not even showing that ministry. Dr. Schindler is a young Jewish doctor. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. And he watched the program. And he came to the mission, I deal with him to one third in the evening. You know, we deal with the soul. Don't let that soul go up. And I prayed about it. I was tired at one thirty. And he gave his heart to the Lord. And right away he gave me patience. And I asked him if he would come to television. Two months. And already three people were saved from his testimony. Amen. Now I have about two hundred Jewish people. I have different films made. I have a Jewish psychologist, Doctor Stern, who teaches at Alba University. You know, Michigan State, 11 years. That man had a convertible Cadillac. He had a summer home. He had everything, material things. He lived on material things. But you know what he tells his customers now? 
I mean, he's a good psychologist. If you came to me, do you want to come back or you want, don't want to come back? I have spiritual help and I have physical help. I can make another appointment and then you don't have to make an appointment more. That's the way he tells his people. And he, t- uh, he told me last week, he said, you know, Dr. Lud, I feel I want to learn more the Bible. I want to go to Bible college. You know, it's terrible. I, we have only one college in Detroit, Detroit Bible College, very modernistic. They're even using the living Bible. And I told Dr. Stern, uh, I know you can give up his job because there's a wife and three children, but if there will be a good college night time, if the Lord calls you to be in His work, He will open the door for you for a good college. Amen. Think of that. A Jewish college, 12 years teaching in the university, one of the largest university, He wants to go in the Lord. Why? He found the Lord. Amen. And now we have most young people, I have many Jewish people, they come home, young girls, young boys, so the parents tell them, you got Jesus, you're not going to finish high school, leave our home. You know more our children, I have many of them. And I love those kids. Amen. No more college. I had before, I performed a wedding last year. A young Jewish girl, a beautiful girl, and she led the, it was in our, her husband to the Lord. They are now teachers in a secular school, Birmingham, Alabama. And Mitch is a beautiful girl, and she used dogs, and she, you know, a young girl, beautiful girl, falling in sin university. And there was no way out. Her parents sent her to Israel, and she came back. She used more dogs. She learned to use dogs in Israel, too. And she came to the mission, she gave up drugs, she gave up sin. And you know, before the wedding, the parents came in and said, we're going to have about 400 Jewish people, but remember, you can mention Jesus. I said, I'm not performing the wedding. Amen. And she led Joel to the Lord. And they both teachers, they're teaching now, Birmingham, Alabama. And Mitch wrote me a letter, said, Dr. Lou, I'm teaching a secular school, but I can help. I open up my school with prayer and reading the Bible. If they're going to put me up, the Lord's going to put me somewhere else. I said, Mitch, go on doing, that's good. That's good, that's good. And many others. But I want to tell you something. There's no greater thing than serving Jesus. And I feel that the Lord called me to the highest calling after all I went through teaching the synagogue, telling my Jewish people the good news of the true Messiah, and that is Jesus. Now, if you're not Jewish, you are Gentile, you need Jesus as much as every Jew. The the Lord cannot save you. The Lord would have saved you. Jesus wouldn't have to die on Calvary. And every Jew goes back to Jerusalem Paying to a wall. You know, the wall cannot save anybody. It is Jesus. And I'm glad to live in this generation when Jesus said, Matthew 24, 34, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So I live in a generation, a Jew, I believe in the Lord Jesus, saying that Israel for 2,000 years it was not a nation, is a nation. They have Jerusalem, and they have the capital, and Jesus can come any day. Amen. And I am going to do when every Jew, every Gentile I can, because the time is short. And we love Jesus, we have to witness for Him. And that Bible is the greatest proof. And I know I am the will and the center of God, that God brought me out all from the gate. And put in a new life, a new heart, a new soul. And even I pray for Germany, I pray for my enemies, like Jesus said. And you know, when a German comes in, I was in a meeting in North Carolina. We had a saved an Arab, we had a Nazi, a saved German. And they put me in the middle, they took a picture. <laughs> IFF, International Fundamental Shit. I was with an Arab and with a German, and they put hands on each other, and I said, that is peace, not like United Nations. I have my mission, John, who was born in Egypt. He graduated from the University of Cairo. His wife is from French. She speaks German and French. And both of them, young people, came and accepted Jesus. And you know, when we come in the mission, we hug each other, show every person, look, Jew and Arab can live together, only Jesus. Not the United Nations, not Carter, not even Reagan can do it. Only Jesus. 
Jew can love Gentile, Gentile can love Jew. In Jesus, we are all one. Ephesians 2.14, Jesus broke down the wall of partition. Isn't that beautiful? That you, my brother, my sister, I may not be good looking, but I still, <laughs> I'm, I'm in your family. I was in, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I say to the church people, I say, you should really thank God for the Jewish people. God said to Abraham, Genesis 12, and these shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. You were one time Gentiles, heathen without God. Now you're spiritual Jews. Now later came over and said, Brother, I don't want to be a spiritual Jew. I said, Go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> because spiritual Jews are going to heaven. <laughs> Isn't that going to be wonderful in heaven? They will be all together. I can't wait for that marriage supper. <laughs> Jesus will be the head of the table, you know, like the pastor, the man, the head of the table. And we will get our crowns for soul winning, for faithfulness, for glory. And we will get an incorruptible body. You know that? I will tell you something. I live with so much hope. I love to see Jesus. Because he is giving me peace, happiness, all my family closer safe, my daughter, my son, my son-in-law, my daughter married a German Christian, <laughs> Spiegel. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Dr. Tom Malone had a Christian school, and my daughter was persecuted in the school, so she went to school, and my son-in-law still don't like Tom Malone, because... He's six foot four and he played basketball. You know, every time he got to the basket, Tom Malone stepped on his foot and then let him to know that they played students against the teachers. He said, Why is Dr. Tom Malone, a teacher, always didn't let me throw in the ball? He stepped on my foot and I couldn't move. He said, The Lord forgive him for that. <laughs> <laughs> and he met my daughter there, and his father and mother are deacons of the First Baptist of Rochester, Michigan. His mother is doing child evangelism. They, my board, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> they board members. I want to tell you people, it's just wonderful what Jesus can do. Amen. And you know something? I'm, I'm in a Jewish city where everybody told me they're going to burn down your building. And I want to tell you something about the Jewish people that you will know. It's a sin for the Orthodox Jews to burn down a church or a shrine. You know, the doom of the rock in Jerusalem would have been destroyed for a long time. But it's a sin for a Jew to destroy a shrine, even a Catholic church or any Protestant church, to destroy or burn down. A Jew will never do it because it's a sin for him. If he does, he's not Orthodox. So I know the Jews are not going to burn down. I had the answer. And I told the Jews are not going to burn down the church. This. And we got a building by faith. We didn't sell bonds from Jewish people. Now, would you believe me or not, every year I have a Passover, and I told that the gym, I turn away this year, April the 10th, 400 people. And you know, it hurt me, because I had most Jewish people unsafe, but Christian people, some were not close, and we have to go a floor up, 400 people more. They pay. That's a Jewish mission. It's not the church. We don't sell bonds. And we got the building, a Jewish man, a land contract. And that Jewish member, Mr. Cohn, what the word means priest, is a member of the synagogue burned down. And everybody said, how come he didn't sell the building to me? I said, you see, the Lord is on my side. I paid for a building, he gave me a building. He said, I am paying for a building, how come God doesn't give me? I said, ask Jesus, because the only way you have to pay by Jesus. Then I, then I used the illustration of the rabbi, I said, the rabbi, I know you're Orthodox Jewish, and I want to tell you sincerely from my heart. How is it when I pray in the synagogue, Shema Yisrael Adonai Adonai Chot, that I close my eyes, and my prayer didn't go farther than the ceiling? How come when I close my eyes, I pray to Jesus, I feel His light next to me? Amen. He said, that's really true. I said, yes. That's why I got the building. <laughs> Amen. 
He said, how come it didn't burn down your building? I said, they use it for Jesus. And he didn't use your building. He didn't need much because Lord let burn down and burn down. And he said, I don't want to go out of the city. Oak Park is a Jewish city, you know. And now people, Orthodox, we can't walk more than 200 feet. And your mission is right in the right place. I said, I'd be glad let me use for Saturday. Oh, not you believe in Jesus. I said, oh. I said, that's what I'm going to believe. And I said, every Jewish person who comes here, that comes... Not a converted Jew, I completed him. You see, 39 books is not enough. 60 books completed. I don't convert the Jews, I complete them. And I don't like to use myself because every synagogue and every Jewish person, the people who come to the wedding, Dr. Schindler, the first question asked me, are you associated with the of New York? May the Jews for Jews? I said, no. Number one, they're charismatic. And they argue with the Jews, and every synagogue in our city is announcing, don't take any literature from the Jews for Jesus, because they argue with the rabbis, they go in synagogues, argue with them. And I said, no, I don't have anything with the Jews for Jesus. Our mission is the hope of Israel. And the hope of Israel is the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. And, uh, and Jesus is not only for Jews, he's for Gentiles also. And if you are here tonight, young or old, Accept Jesus in your heart. You know, I wasn't worried much when I accepted Jesus. My brother offered fifty thousand dollars. You know, I became <laughs> more worldly if I give up Jesus. My uncles offered me more to starting a business, but you know, I'm more worried now than but I didn't believe in Jesus, money-wise. <laughs> and then spiritually, you know, money you can't buy spiritually things. It's a gift of God, eternal. And there's another thing. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. Nobody can take away my salvation. Amen. Everything God gives is eternal. Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in should not perish but have everlasting life. You know how it sounds in German, John 3, 16? God of the world so great, or than an einzigen Sohn, for in the Sünde an den Kreuz sterben, wir meten, das eibiges Leben haben. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I want you to pray for us. You know, it's still the Jewish people had a veil for 2,000 years. Even the Lord Jesus himself didn't have Yizim with them, you remember? It's not a Yizim ministry, but it's an enjoying ministry. And if you come across Jewish people, don't give them up. I come across Jehovah's Witness, I come across Catholics, I come across Lutherans. I don't give them up either. Because everybody who has a soul, we have to tell them about Jesus. And if you will need any help from me, I will more than glad. I even made that track out to point at you to Christ, 11 points. You have cassettes, and this Bible will help you also, but I gave Dr. Orkman, King James. And you can order them from the mail. And we thank the Lord for this church for supporting us. And many other good churches. And I thank the Lord I'm supported but independent from the mental Baptist church. I don't, know, I don't have any Southern Baptist supporting me, American Baptist, only from the mental Baptist. Isn't that wonderful? That couldn't be any closer than the Baptist. A saved Jewish Baptist. <laughs> Going to heaven. Tasted hell already, you know. I know a little of hell, but I'm not going to do more hell more. I'm, I'm glad I'm not going here in tribulation. I'm waiting for the Jesus now. Are you? Let us all stand. I want to tell you tomorrow night I'm going to give a message. Present day signs of the Lord Jesus second coming. Come with your Bibles because they have a Bible study. And showing the film Dr. Schindler and Elizabeth. Tuesday night, 
last generation. Hasadat and Begin, the first snow ever fallen in Jerusalem in 50 years. And also pointing that we can be the last generation Jesus is coming to the Mandavalis. And I will be having a message, the temple. Four scriptures from the Old Testament, three scriptures fulfilled, one scripture not fulfilled yet. And we're going to have Bible studies. So come and bring your friends and thank Dr. Rockman, Brother Jim, for inviting me. I love to be with you. I will tell you, you are so happy Christians that when I go to others, look like they're dying. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, I was once close to death, and I, and I w- want to be among living people. I love people who love the Lord. Uh, you know, it's good to love Jesus. We have to, have, we have to be happy. We're going to heaven. We didn't pay our money. We don't have to worry. It's all paid for. <laughs> Every head by the eye close. Young or old, you're not coming to me. You're not coming to Dr. Rockman. If you never accepted Jesus in your hearts, I want you to know, children, that you're born in sins. In time, and the age come, you go in thinking, oh, what am I going to do with my sins? When you come, you ask Jesus to take away your sins. If you are in the age of accountability, that you know what sins are, you see, my children were saved, they were five years of age. And when you know what sins are, it's the time that you get saved too. And I wonder if anyone in this congregation never found Jesus, you like to accept him tonight, open your heart, he forgive you of your sins, you become a child of God. Would you raise your hand? Say, I'm going to accept Jesus tonight. I'm going to make my decision. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, don't leave this church without Jesus. Anyway, 